So anyway, so now we move into that really horrific period for Ted Bundy when he goes down to Florida. Um, what created that? Why did he become that Ted Bundy? Well, uh, I have to say he he was no more violent there than here. He was very the violence that was within him was was egregious from the moment he began killing. So the violence didn't increase. What did happen, and this is what you're noticing, it had been so long since he killed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Once he, he yeah, hungry. that's it. It had, yeah. It, it was, he was he was a man. Yeah, he was hungry. He he was just on a, he was going to go on a bender, and it wasn't going to be anything like it. If you study the murders at Chi Omega and 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 the savage things he mm-hmm. did there, when I say sa- he was savage other places, but it was all disorganized. It was numbers. It, it, yeah, it was. In fact, he never attacked so many women at one time. Yeah. It was about that spillover. Mm-hmm. He he hadn't killed in several years, and it was just he was overwhelmed with it. And keep in mind. Even after killing two and thinking he'd probably killed two others, Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler, who shared the same room, uh, he he's not satiated. He wasn't done. He, he went, goes he down into an apartment. Yeah, a duplex. Yeah. yeah. Cheryl Thomas's. And guess what? He had seen Cheryl Thomas before. Okay. In fact, Cheryl Thomas believed she'd seen him before riding past her place on a bike. She said that on the uh, snapped. Uh, uh, oxygen network uh, t- uh, it, it, it was uh, it was a Ted Bundy doc uh, n- notorious you know like Ted Bundy and um, yeah she, she said I just, it just he's probably the guy that rode by on a bike I just I'd, I'd seen him before so he knew where he was going so the two murders and the and 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 the and and the terrible attacks on Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner weren't enough yeah he had to go down there carrying the same log that had lost a lot of its bark in Chi Omega from the attack. And he was walking down around 315 headed towards this duplex. And a guy was driving by in the car and noticed him because he could tell he was trying to conceal something uh, by behind his leg, like on the side. And the guy was driving by. He said, I slowed down. And I looked at him. And uh, so he, he was trying to conceal something. So he again goes in there and attacks her. And the only thing that the only thing that saved uh, Cheryl Thomas, he would have killed her for sure. After savagely beating her, he was going to have intercourse with her again, where she's face down and strangled her to death. But the pounding on the wall from Debbie Sicarelli and her roommate, because they all three knew each other there in the other duplex and the phone calls she was making and the pounding on the wall, Bundy just, you know, he masturbated right there and there was a semen stain found on the bed, but out the window he went and he couldn't perform it. So if you look at his very last murder, which was the murder of Kim Leach, 12 years old, he right? had been satiated. He had been and this was this was on um, February 9th of um, 1978. Um, he felt pretty satiated from what he had done in Tallahassee. So. He couldn't get anybody and all that hunting he had done the night before on February 8th. And I've tracked all his movements. It's in the record. Um, but he did see her. And it's terrible how things happen by chance. She had left her purse in a portable. I think she was either in the portable. I can't remember now. I have to have to my book, yeah, you're right. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and but they have and they, there's the main school and then just about, you know, 75 feet across the yard to the, if you're standing in the back of it, to the left, there's these white portable buildings. And she was, she had to pick up her purse. Um, uh, A teacher named Bishop told her to go get a purse. And this teacher, he was alive today, so torn up about it. So she goes get the purse that she forgot, or she wouldn't have been making that thing across the the grounds of, of the rear of the school. Bundy spotted her, stopped the van, went and got her. So it's only by chance that this happened. But um, that was a little bit different killing because he was stalking people Mm -hmm. and he wasn't going to go in and just start going into another thing and doing, repeating what he had done at Chi Omega. He was back to stalking Mm -hmm. one person at one time, which had been his standard MO throughout his years of murder. But you're right, Chi Omega was completely different. If you're a detective looking at Chi Omega, 
You're thinking it's a different uh, you're, killer. You're not going to think it's yeah. Bundy. No. Um, which, which is interesting because it was, for those of you who aren't familiar with what happened at Chi Omega, the sorority house, um, the attacks were, you know, we won't get in here, but they were incredibly, incredibly vicious. So vicious, so vicious that he bit um, one of the victims twice on their buttocks. But what happened is the greatest karma of all, the savagery of those attacks are what ended up nailing him because he left a perfect imprint of his teeth on that victim. And the sheriff later was able to get him to give him to give a, a dental record or get a dental record out of him. And they matched up. They were a perfect match uh, to the, the dental. To, I mean, to the teeth marks on the victim. And that is one of the things that nailed him. So I love the fact that that is actually, you know, one of the things that put him away. Oh, yeah. And you know what? That, that was not planned. That had to be some animalistic thing that rose up within him because because he also severed one of the nipples with his teeth. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Chi Omega attack. If you're looking at that, you're thinking it's a different killer because it, it was not. Well, it was just like it was it was like it was out of control. Yeah. And if you look at some of his other things, and oh, I'll, I'll tell you another thing that came out in that No Man of God is that Bundy ad, admitted to um, um, when he killed Julie Cunningham that, of course, he had sex with her after she was dead because he was a necrophile. But he, but he said, but he told Hagmar, and this apparently had not come out before, that he severed her head. Now, one thing they did do in the movie is that <clears throat> they added, uh, it's, it's true, but it didn't come out in the confession when they said, what about the girl that you took to the hotel room in Pocatello? He said, Oh, I drowned her in the, in, in my room. That didn't come out in the confession. That's one of the, the new things I discovered when I was, I was writing the Bundy murders. The Idaho investigator told me, here's what happened. I went to, um, I called Bill Hagmar up once and I said, and I was writing these murders sequentially. And I said, uh, and, and, and Bill had helped me. And I said to, um, I called him up and I said, Bill, I'm getting ready to, to, to write about this girl. I have her name, Lynette Culver. She was 12 years old and Bundy murdered her. And I said, but um, I was told, and I'm hoping, hoping you can help me with this and have more information. I was told that, um, that uh, she was drowned in his room. In fact, I was told she was drowned in the bathtub. I got that directly from Mike Fisher, the Colorado investigator. And he said, well, Kevin, he said, I, I know Mike. And I have great respect for Mike. He said, but I sat in every confession that Bundy ever made. And that never came out. And I, I need to tell you, too, though, his standard MO was having sex with them from behind while he strangles them to death. And I said, well, yeah, Bill, I know. And by that time, I'm thinking, well, maybe Mike's wrong about this. And, and, and he said, also, if that meeting took place, it was an unscheduled meeting, and it shouldn't have taken place because Ted wanted me there for every confession with all the detectives from these states. And I said, well, I get that. I said, well, listen, I'll go back and check, and um, I'll let you know. If, if, if I can, in fact, he said to me, if you can confirm that, let, let me know. And I said, I would. So I called Mike Fisher back and I said, Mike, here's what happened. He said, well, look, I got that directly from the Idaho investigator, investigator, Randy Everett, when we were all down in Florida doing these end of life confessions. Okay. And so he said, call Russ, you know, Renault. So I had gotten Renault's number. And he, he's another nice guy. And I called Russ. He said, oh, yeah, well, here's why Bill doesn't know it. He said, we only had an hour. And of course, I've got the full transcript. It was really quick paced. They were going back between two murders in Idaho. The hitchhiker Bundy picked up on his way to law school and uh, then the killing of Lynette Culver. And he said, we were going back, uh, just back and forth. And, and Bundy had already admitted that even though the body wasn't found, this hitchhiker, there was cranial damage. In other words, he hit her in the head with a crowbar. So Renault said, will there be cranial damage on the girl? He said, no. Uh, he said, it'll be drowning. And because Bundy had said he had deposited her, <coughs> excuse me, in a river.